If I were to ask you, could you please make me a cup of tea right now? Would you do it? Don't do it. Don't get up, don't get up. But what would, some of you would be definitely, others of you might be a bit embarrassed. But the question I really want to dig down is, why would you or not do it? Why would you make me a cup of tea? There's all sorts of motives. But what about, less about me, what about someone you deeply know? Someone you deeply care about? And they asked you to make them a cup of tea. Why would you do it? Now, I'm guessing there'll be all sorts of reasons. Some of them might be to show kindness, to show appreciation, to show a genuine care for them. Sometimes it might be because you're trying to impress them. You're trying to win their favor. Sometimes you're just doing it because you like to please people and so you'll just do it. There's all sorts of motives, isn't there? Just to make a cup of tea. What about when it comes to serving God? Now, if you're just checking out who Jesus is, we love that you're here. Here at St. David's, we're on about serving God, loving Him and serving Him. And so what is it about us that motivates us to serve God? Now, if there's multiple motives when it comes to making a cup of tea, I can imagine there's multiple motives when it comes to serving God. And as we come to 1 Corinthians 13, that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. Dealing with for the Corinthians and dealing with for us. What motivates us? What is, what are our desires, our inner thoughts that drive us to serve God and to serve His people? And so as we think about this, we come to chapter, well, the end of chapter 13, uh, 12, in fact, and the Apostle Paul shows us you can be spectacular and yet still be nothing. Look with me, verse uh, before we go into verse 31, the context is, if you weren't with us last week, chapter 12, if you've got your Bibles open, you can flick back chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning the gifts of the Spirit, or literally spiritual things, the Apostle Paul wants to explain to the Corinthians what it looks like to be spiritual. And we saw it last week, verse 3 of chapter 12, it's someone who says, Jesus is Lord. To be able to confess with your mouth, not just the words, but in your heart, that Jesus is your King, your Lord, the one whom you follow above everyone else. And 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, this is only possible if God's Spirit dwells in you. That's what it looks like to be spiritual, God's Spirit dwelling in you so that you can confess that Jesus is your King, your Lord, the one you follow. And in light of that, we saw as 1 Corinthians 12 goes on, God gives His Spirit to His people. And so His Spirit dwells in us, and then that manifests into spiritual gifts. And verse 7, the purpose of spiritual gifts is for the common good, for God's people, for the glory of God and for the building up of God's people. And then the rest of chapter 12, which we saw last week, he goes on to explain that the people of God are a body, Jesus' body. And we all have different gifts, but we all have a different part to play. And every part matters. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what gifts you have, every part matters. And when every part plays their part, the body, God's people, function healthily. And so then we get to verse 31 of chapter 12. And have a look with me as what the Apostle Paul says. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Can you imagine the Corinthians? They hear this and go, hang on a moment. Didn't you just say earlier, Paul, that all the gifts are important, that they're all valuable, because every single person in God's people are valuable? And now you're saying there's greater gifts? And you can imagine some of the Corinthians going, yeah, I want those greater gifts. But before he gets there, and we'll get there next week when we get to chapter 14. If you want a sneak peek, write down chapter 14, verse 12. You'll get an answer about what he's talking about, but we'll look about it more next week. But the point is, before you get to eagerly design the greater gifts, Paul deals with something even more spectacular, more excellent. Did you see it? I'll show you the most excellent way. What is this most excellent way? Well, he goes on in chapter 13. And in chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, he first of all shows what it looks like to display magnificent spiritual gifts, spectacular spiritual gifts. 
Have a look with me as he kind of takes spiritual gifts that he's been speaking about and then sets them to the extreme. Verse 1 of chapter 13, if we're speaking tongues, that is other languages, and he's not just talking about other human languages, he even says languages of the angels. But then also in verse 2, he talks about a, a person who has the gift of prophecy. Now what is prophecy? We'll talk about that again next week, chapter 14. But it's a little hint, 14 verse 3. Speaking the word where it is comforting, encouraging, and strengthening God's people. But we'll talk about that more next week. But it's not just that this person has the gift of prophecy. Did you see? He builds it up and also can fathom not just some, all mysteries, and not just some knowledge, but all knowledge. And then on top of that, this person also has faith that can move mountains. It's like he's building a Marvel character, but in the spiritual realm, a super spiritual person. Seems to have all the gifts. So spectacular. But it's even not just a spectacular that everyone sees. You see in verse 3, he also talks about the one who would give up all they possess to the poor. And then on top of that, be willing to suffer for Jesus. Perhaps even die for Jesus. Paul sets up what it looks like to display spectacular spiritual gifts. But did you hear the phrase as Kathleen was reading our Bible today. Three times the same phrase came up in those three verses. Have a look with me. Middle of verse 1, but do not have love. Near the end of verse 2, but do not have love. Near the end of verse 3, but do not have love. Paul says you can be spectacular, you can look magnificent, and yet if you do not have love, what are you? Well, you're like this. A clanging symbol. It's noisy. It's impressive. Oh, it's not really that impressive. I just hit it. But it's, imp- it's noisy. And yet, it's nothing. Didn't help you understand God at all. Didn't help you get a clearer picture of who God is. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, you can be using these spiritual gifts even with the purpose of building up God's people. And yet... If your motive is not love, verse 2, end of verse 2, I am nothing. You and me, we're nothing. End of verse 3, without love, we gain nothing. It's a challenge for the Corinthians, it's a challenge for us. We may have impressive gifts. You may have spectacular gifts from God. You may even be seeking to use them for the common good of God's people. And yet, do we have love driving us? Which then begs the question, what love? What is this love that God speaks about, that the Apostle Paul is speaking about? Because if we listen to what our world says about love, well, we get very confused, don't we? Our culture says, What's the, what's the current motto at the moment of what love is? Love is love. And it sounds lovely. It flows off your tongue and it sounds, oh, what a lovely motto. But if you think about it for a moment, love is love doesn't tell you anything about love. It's not bringing any clarity, no definition. It's like if I were to ask you, can you define a pineapple? And you say to me, a pineapple, John, is a pineapple. It doesn't actually give me a definition of what a pineapple is. It's just restating what it is. But God is not like our culture. He doesn't just give us pithy mottos that actually give no definition. God gives us clarity on what love is. And the reason He does this is so that we can love how God loves What's amazing about what God does in this passage here is not so much that God defines love, but He does something even more helpful for us. He gives us descriptions of love. And His descriptions are practical. In fact, as we look at this passage from verse 4 to 7, He shows us both what love is and what love isn't, which is very helpful actually. To not just know what it is, but what it isn't. And so we're going to look at that. And firstly, I'm going to focus on what love isn't. Have a look with me. Chapter 13, verse 4, halfway through. Love does not envy, 
does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it does not keep a record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. It's quite a substantive list, isn't it, of what love isn't. Now remember, it's in the context of, as you seek to glorify God using the spiritual gifts God has given you, with the common good as the outcome... What's your motive? And what we see here is it's not to be like the things described here. It's to be love, not not love. Let me put it another way. Are our motives, our desires, our inner thoughts, are they to serve God fueled by, verse 4, envy? Do I exercise my gifts with the motive of becoming bitter when I see other people succeed or when I rejoice when they fail. Verse 4, boasting. Do I exercise my gifts when my motive is to make people see what a great job I'm doing? Verse 4, pride. Do I exercise my gifts where my motive is to make myself look better than I actually am, to make myself more competent or capable or gifted than I actually am. Verse 5, dishonouring others. Do I exercise my gifts where my motive is actually to bring shame, bring dishonour, bring disgrace on those around me? Verse 5, self-seeking. Do I exercise my gifts when my motive is to get people to look at me, to admire me, to glorify me? Verse 5, easily angered. Do I exercise my spiritual gifts with the motive to irritate others, to frustrate others. Verse 5, keeps no record of wrongs. Do I exercise my spiritual gifts where my motive is to remember all the times those people have hurt me and then choose to not exercise my gifts maybe fully or at all when they're around? Verse 6, delight in evil. Do I exercise my spiritual gifts where my motive is to enjoy wickedness against God and against others? It's quite a confronting list, isn't it? And it really digs into our heart. And if I'm honest with myself, I look at that list and go, Guilty. There are times when as I seek to exercise the gifts God has given me, my motives aren't motivated by love, but sadly, what is not love. But our great God doesn't just leave us to wallow in our guilt. He doesn't just give us a definition of what love isn't. He also gives us a definition of what love is. Look at the beginning of verse 4. Love is patient. To exercise my gifts, where my motive is not to whinge or complain, even when things are difficult. Now it is wonderful to see that happening here at St. David's. Particularly if you serve in any ministry that requires technology. It falls apart all the time. I mean, this is the reason why we've got these speakers and all the things happening, because our sound desk of less than two years is already broken. And yet, so many serve without grumbling, without whinging. Love is patient. Verse 4 goes on. Love is kind. To exercise my spiritual gifts where my desire, my motive is for the best of others. 
to be a genuine, caring person towards others. Again, we, we see this so often here at St. David's. And particularly after church when people are talking, but I also want to encourage you before church to welcome people who visit because they generally come early. But there's those conversations where people are seeking to have genuine conversations with you, encouraging you, spurring you on, listening intently, and also saying, we should pray about that, and then praying about that. One of the things that I love here at St. David's is, uh, in God's kindness, we continue to have new people join us. Perhaps that's you today. It's your first time here, which we love. Uh, You're not the only one. But what's been really interesting as I chat to these people who visit us for the first time, particularly those who don't know Jesus, and they're just checking out who Jesus is, and they chat to me and say, John, do you know what's really interesting? When I come here, strangers are kind to me. (laughs) It's so different to what I experience in the world. Love is kind, and it's flowing out in our lives. Verse 6, love rejoices with the truth. To exercise my spiritual gifts with the motive that's grounded in God's truth and a joy and a peace and a comfort that knows that God loves me. The truth that the message of the cross, chapter 1, verse 18, is not foolishness, but is the power of God, the power to save. See, it's because of what love is and what love isn't that Paul can say in verse 7 such an encompassing description of love. Look with me at verse 7. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, it's helpful, first of all, to understand this is talking about God's love, not our love. God's love always protects, or a better translation, always endures. His love continues even when we get pushed back from the world. God's love always trusts that our trust, our belief in who Jesus is and what he's done for us. God's love always hopes that because of who Jesus is and what he does for us, we can have a hope, not like worldly hope, which we go, ah, hope it's not going to rain today and we're not certain, but a certain hope, God's hope. Because of who Jesus is, there is a certain eternal hope we have, eternal home we look forward to. And God's love always perseveres. Doesn't matter how much pushback. Doesn't matter how much hardship. God continues to love us relentlessly. It's such an amazing picture of love, isn't it? God's love is so different to the world's definition of love. Love is love. Rubbish. This is love. And yet we can hear this description of love, and I don't know about you, but it can feel overwhelming, can't it? How are we meant to express and be motivated by this type of love? God's love seems so all-encompassing. What hope do we have to be motivated by this type of love? Which gets us to our final point that I want us to reflect on. Love lasts. God's love lasts. God's love, in fact, outlasts all gifts. Have a look with me, verse 8. Love never fails. Love never ends. And then he goes on in verse 8 to compare that to prophecies, to tongues, to knowledge. And what happens to those things? They fail. They end. They don't last. Why? Verse 10. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. A better translation of that word completeness is actually when the perfect comes. Who's the perfect? Jesus. Paul reminds the Corinthians, you've got to get your right perspective. In the context of when Jesus returns, all those spiritual gifts, no matter how spectacular they are, will disappear. Because then Jesus is here. 
And when Jesus comes, everything changes. And so he goes on in verse 11 and 12 to give us two examples of when the times change, how you behave in those times change. So in verse 11, he first of all gives the first example of going from a child to an adult. In verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. This is me, five years old, first day of school. Uh, Let me tell you what I thought back then. Uh, It seems like I thought that tucking my shirt in into short shorts was the way to go. Uh, And I also thought girls were gross, didn't want anything to do with girls. And yet I grew up, became an adult. I don't wear short shorts and I don't tuck in my t-shirt into my short shorts. But more importantly, I understand that women are valuable. I'm so thankful to God for women in my life. For my wife, Kiralee, for my daughter, for my mum. But also for the women in our ministry team. For Kathy and Sarah and Marina. And for many of you, my sisters in Christ. You can go from being a child to an adult. Your thinking changes because the times have changed. But then he uses another example having to do with a mirror. Have a look with me at chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. See, when Jesus comes, things change. At the moment, we only see Jesus as like a reflection in a mirror. Now, it gives enough clarity as we look at God's Word to get glimpses of who Jesus is to get glimpses, to know enough that he is worth following, that he is worth trusting him. We get glimpses enough to go, this man willingly gave up his life for me to be saved, for you to be saved. But it's only glimpses. When Jesus returns, we don't just get the reflection. We get to see him face to face. When Jesus returns, things change. It's quite amazing, isn't it? And he goes on in verse 12. Have a look with me. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. See, even the Apostle Paul, the guy that wrote a lot of the New Testament, only knows Jesus in part. But he's saying when Jesus returns, I will know him fully and just as I am already fully known. You are already fully known by God. When Jesus returns, it will be reciprocated. We will fully know Him. Not in the same way, He's God, we're humans, but in the way in which we can fully know God because we will have perfected, resurrected bodies. That's why the Apostle Paul talks about this in chapter 15. Look forward to that in a few weeks' time. But the point is, When Jesus returns, even the most spectacular, the magnificent, the flamboyant spiritual gifts will mean nothing compared to seeing Jesus face to face. I'm not sure if you've done this before, but I know many who would pay, I don't know them personally, but I know people who would be willing to pay thousands of dollars to have a meet and greet with someone famous an actor, musician. We get something much better than just a meet and greet. We can see Jesus face to face. And it's costly. But Jesus paid the price for us. He willingly gave up his life for you and me so that we can get to see him when he returns face to face. And not just for a moment, because that's all we could pay for, but for eternity, because he paid for it. That's the perspective that the Apostle Paul wants the Corinthians to have, especially as they seek these greater spiritual gifts. Because love is the greatest. Have a look with me in verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. These three virtues remain both now and forever. But did you see the end of verse 13? But the greatest of these is love. 
What is it about love that lasts, or not only that lasts, both now and forever, but it's the greatest? I take it because of who God is. God is love. We see this in 1 John. But not only that, it's because of God's love that we can have faith, trusting Him. It's only because of God's love that we can have hope, a certainty of where we are going for eternity because of Him. Love is the greatest. And so we've come back to chapter 12, verse 31. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Paul says to desire those greater gifts, you need to have the motivation of the most excellent way. What's that? The greatest virtue, love. God's love. It's not a coincidence that the word greatest in verse 13 is the same as greatest in the verse 31 of chapter 12. You can't seek the greatest gifts unless you first of all have the greatest motivation, God's love. So then how are we to sustain being motivated by God's love? Two reflections to finish. Firstly, have we grasped God's love for us? See, the way that God describes His love here is that He first loved us and then lavished His love upon us. See, it's not like the love of our world. How does our world define love? Well, I love you because of who you are. I love you because you're lovable. How does God love us? He loves us when we were unlovable, when we rejected Him, when we ignored Him, when we cursed Him. And yet He still chose to love us. See, God's love is different to our love. God's love is self-originating. It comes from Him because of who He is and then it flows out onto us, the unlovable. When our hearts have been captivated by that love, that's what fuels us to keep loving others. That's what fuels our desire to exercise the spiritual gifts. All of us have been given different spiritual gifts by God's Spirit for the common good, motivated by God's love. What's really encouraging is as our church, we continue to start to run more of our ministries as teams. And I've been encouraged to see team leaders praying with their teams before they start to serve in any whatever ministry to remind one another, why are we doing this? We're not just trying to do tasks. We're not even trying to do ministries for the sake of the common good. We're doing it motivated by God's love. And it's encouraging when team leaders are also then opening up God's word and saying, let's be reminded. Why are we doing this? What is it about God's love that shapes us? That we're not just doing things, but we're motivated by the love that God first lavished upon us. We can't do this by our own efforts. But God has given us His Spirit. He has shown us His love. And He's shown us that eternal perspective. When our eyes are fixed on Him, that's what motivates us. That's what fuels deep down inside. But let's pray that we might be people that keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and let that fuel our love for Him and for others as we exercise the wonderful spiritual gifts that He has given each one of us. Let's pray. Father God, You are a great God and You have shown us what love really is. I think you didn't just give us a definition, you describe your love to us so that we can then reciprocate that to others. Let that love flow from what we've received from you to how we seek to exercise the gifts you have given each one of us. But Father, we also acknowledge that there have been times when our hearts 
have not been fueled by your love, but sadly been fueled by the things that are not love. Please forgive us. Please, by your Spirit, help us to repent and to turn away from that. May you transform our hearts to love as you have loved. And Father, we pray that you would remind us constantly that we will one day see your Son face to face. And that hope, that certainty, may also drive our motivation to love like you have loved us. And we pray all this so that as we exercise the spiritual gifts you have generously given us for the common good of your people and for your glory, we may do it motivated by your love as you first loved us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.